Hello and welcome to video two of Charlotte's Web. We are reading aloud the book Charlotte's Web in video one. We read chapter one and chapter two. This is video two and we are going to read chapter three and chapter four in this video. So this is chapter three and chapter four. And this book is by E.B. White and has some pictures by Garth Williams. If you haven't been reading with us yet, I hope you'll go back and watch chapters one and two, but if a quick review is that Fern lived, this little girl is Fern and she lives on a farm and there was a litter of pigs born, which means a whole group of pigs born to one mother. And there was a runt, a baby that was too small and might not make it. And her father was going to kill the runt, but she rid the world of injustice by saying that wasn't fair and getting her father to let her raise the pig. But when the pig is five weeks old, it's too big and eating too much food. Um, the, the father says it's costing too much money to feed the pig and he has to go. So Fern has just agreed to sell the pig to her uncle and her uncle is coming to pick up the pig. We have some questions we're gonna be listening for. In chapter three, we're listening for why does Wilbur escape? And that gives us a little clue that Wilbur's gonna escape. In chapter three, we're going to listen for why does he return home. In chapter four, we're going to listen for why, what does Wilbur want more than anything. In chapter four, we're going to listen for what does Wilbur feel when the sheep tells him that he is less than nothing. In chapter four, we're going to listen for have you ever accidentally or on purpose made someone feel that way. So let's listen for those things in chapter three and chapter four of the book Charlotte's Web, and this is video number two of Charlotte's Web. Chapter three, Escape. The barn was very large. It was very old. It smelled of hay, and it smelled of manure. It smelled of the perspiration of tired horses and the wonderful sweet breath of patient cows. It often had a sort of peaceful smell, as though nothing bad could happen ever again in the world. It smelled of grain and of harnesses dressing and of axle grease and of rubber boots and of new rope. And whenever the cat was given a fresh fish head to eat, the barn would smell of fish. But mostly it smelled of hay, for there was always hay in the great loft up overhead. And there was always hay being pitched down to the cows and the horses and the sheep. The barn was pleasantly warm in the winter when the animals spent most of their time indoors. And it was pleasantly cool in the summer when the big doors stood wide open to the breeze. The barn had stalls on the main floor for the workhorses, tie-ups on the main floor for the cows, a sheepfold down below for the sheep a pig pen down below for Wilbur. And it was full of all sorts of things you find in barns. Ladders, rhinestones, pitchforks, monkey wrenches, scythes, lawn mowers, snow shovels, ax handles, milk pails, water buckets, empty grain sacks, and rusty rat traps. It was the kind of barn that swallows like to build their nests in. It was the kind of barn that children like to play in. And the whole thing was owned by Fern's uncle, Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman. Wilbur's new home was in the lower part of the barn, directly underneath the cows. Mr. Zuckerman knew that the manure pile is a good place to keep a young pig. Pigs need warmth and it was warm and comfortable down there in the barn cellar on the south side. Fern came almost every day to visit him. She found an old milking stool that had been discarded and she placed the stool in the sheepfold next to Wilbur's pen. Here she sat quietly during the long afternoons, thinking and listening and watching Wilbur. The sheep soon got to know her and trust her. So did the geese who lived with the sheep. All the animals trusted her, 
She was so quiet and friendly. Mr. Zuckerman did not allow her to take Wilbur out, and he did not allow her to go into the pig pen. But he told Fern that she could sit on the stool and watch Wilbur as long as she wanted to. It made her happy just to be near the pig, and it made Wilbur happy to know that she was sitting there right outside his pen. But he never had any fun. No walks, no rides, no swims. One afternoon in June, when Wilbur was almost two months old, he wandered out into a small yard outside the barn. Fern had not arrived for her usual visit. Wilbur stood in the sun, feeling lonely and bored. There's never anything to do around here, he thought. He walked slowly to his food trough and sniffed to see if anything had been overlooked at lunch. He found a small strip of potato skin and ate it. His back itched, so he leaned against the fence and rubbed against the boards. When he tired of this, he walked indoors, climbed to the top of the manure pile, and sat down. He didn't feel like going to sleep. He didn't feel like digging. He was tired of standing still, tired of laying down. I'm less than two months old, and I'm tired of living, he said. He walked out to the yard again. When I'm out here, he said, there's no place to go but in. When I'm indoors, there's no place to go but out in the yard. That's where you're wrong, my friend, my friend, said a voice. Wilbur looked through the fence and saw the goose standing there. You don't have to stay in that dirty little, dirty little, dirty little yard, said the goose, who talked rather fast. One of the boards is loose. Push on it. Push, push, push on it, and come on out. What? said Wilbur. Say it slower. At, 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 at the risk of repeating myself, said the goose, I suggest that you come on out. It's wonderful out here. Did you say a board was loose? That I did, said the goose. Wilbur walked up to the fence and saw that the goose was right. One board was loose. He put his head down, shut his eyes, and pushed. The board gave way. In a minute, he had squeezed through the fence and was standing in the long grass outside his yard. The goose chuckled. How does it feel to be free? She asked. I like it, said Wilbur. That is, I guess I like it. Actually, Wilbur felt queer to be outside his fence, with nothing between him and the big world. Where do you think I'd better go? Anywhere you like, anywhere you like, said the goose. Go down through the orchard and root up the sod. Go down through the garden, dig up the radishes, root up everything, eat grass, look for corn, look for oats, run all over, skip and dance. Jump and prance. Go down through the orchard and stroll in the woods. The world is a wonderful place when you're young. I can see that, replied Wilbur. He gave a jump in the air, twirled, ran a few steps, stopped, looked around, sniffed the smells of the afternoon, and set off walking down through the orchard. Pausing in the shade of an apple tree, he put his strong snout into the ground and began pushing, digging, and rooting. He felt very happy. He had plowed up quite a piece of ground before anyone noticed him. Mrs. Zuckerman, who was the first to see him, saw him from the kitchen window, and she immediately shouted for the men. Homer! she cried. Pigs out! Larvy! Pigs out! Homer! Larvy! Pigs out! He's down there under the apple tree! Now the trouble starts, thought Wilbur. Now I'll catch it. The goose heard the racket, and she too started hollering, Run, 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 downhill, make for the woods, woods and woods, she shouted to Wilbur. They'll never, never, never catch you in the woods. The cocker spaniel heard the commotion, and he ran out from the barn to join the chase. Mr. Zuckerman heard, and he came out of the machine shed where he was mending a tool. Lurvy, the hired man, 
heard noise and came up from the asparagus patch where he was pulling weeds. Everybody walked towards Wilbur, and Wilbur didn't know what to do. The woods seemed a long way off, and anyway, he'd never been down there in the woods and wasn't sure he'd like it. Get around behind him, Larvy, said Mr. Zuckerman, and drive him toward the barn, and take it easy. Don't rush him. I'll go get a bucket of slops. The news of Wilbur's escape spread rapidly among the animals on the place. Whenever any creature broke loose on Zuckerman's farm, the event was of great interest to the others. The goose shouted the new, near, to the nearest cow that Wilbur was free, and soon all of the cows knew. Then one of the cows told one of the sheep, and soon all of the sheep knew. The lambs learned about it from their mothers. The horses in their stalls in the barn pricked up their ears, and when they heard the goose hollering, and soon the horses had caught on to what was happening. Wilbur's out, they said. Every animal stirred and lifted its head and became excited to know that one of his friends had gotten free and was no longer pinned up or tied fast. Wilbur didn't know what to do or which way to run. It seemed as though everybody was after him. If this is what it's like to be free, he thought, I believe I'd rather be pinned up in my own yard. The Cocker Spaniel was sneaking up on him from one side. Lurvy, the hired man, was sneaking up on him from the other side. Mr. Zuckerman stood ready to head him off and started for the garden. And now Mr. Zuckerman was coming down the hill. Oh, Mrs. Zuckerman stood ready to head him off and was he started for the garden, and now Mr. Zuckerman was coming down toward him, carrying a pail. This is really awful, thought Wilbur. Why doesn't Fern come? He began to cry. The goose took command and began to give orders. Don't, don't just stand there, Wilbur. Dodge about, dodge about, cried the goose. Skip around, run toward me, slip in and out, and in and out, and in and out. Make for the woods, twist and turn. The Cocker Spaniel sprang for Wilbur's hind leg. Wilbur jumped and ran. Lurvy reached out and grabbed. Mrs. Zuckerman screamed at Lurvy. The goose cheered for Wilbur. Wilbur dodged between Lurvy's legs. Lurvy missed Wilbur and grabbed the Spaniel instead. Nicely done, nicely done, cried the goose. Try it again, try it again. Run downhill, suggested the cows. Run toward me, yelled the gander. Run uphill, cried the sheep. Turn and twist, honked the goose. Jump and dance, said the rooster. What do you think Wilbur should do? What would you do if you were out and everyone was yelling and chasing you? What do you think Wilbur is going to do? Look out for Larvy, called the cows. Look out for Zuckerman, yelled the gander. Watch out for the dog, cried the sheep. Listen to me, listen to me, screamed the goose. Poor Wilbur was dazed and frightened by this hullabaloo. Have you ever heard of a hullabaloo? If you get a picture of what's going on in your head, that's exactly what a hullabaloo is. A big mess with lots of noise and activity is a hullabaloo. He didn't like being the center of all this fuss. He tried to follow the instructions his friends were giving him, but he couldn't run downhill and uphill at the same time, and he couldn't turn and twist when he was jumping and dancing and he was crying so hard he could barely see anything that was happening. After all, Wilbur was a very young pig, not much more than a baby, really. He wished Fern were there to take, her, take him into her arms and comfort him. When he looked up and saw Mr. Zuckerman standing quite close to him, holding a pail of warm slops, he felt relieved. He lifted his nose and sniffed. The smell was delicious. Warm milk, potato skins, wheat middlings, Kellogg's cornflakes, and a popover left over from the Zuckerman's breakfast. Come, pig, said Mr. Zuckerman, tapping the pail. 
Come, pig. Wilbur took a step toward the pail. No, 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 said the goose. It's the old pail trick. Wilbur, don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. He's trying to lure you back into the captivity of the. He's appealing to your stomach. Wilbur didn't care. The food smelled appetizing. He took another step toward the pail. Pig, pig, said Mr. Zuckerman in a kind voice and began walking slowly toward the barnyard, looking all about him innocently as if he didn't know the little white pig was following behind him. You'll be sorry, 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 called the goose. Wilbur didn't care. He kept walking toward the pail of slops. You'll miss your freedom, honked the goose. And an hour of freedom is worth a barrel of slops. Wilbur didn't care. When Mr. Zuckerman reached the pig pen, he climbed over the fence and poured the slops into the trough. Then he pulled the loose board away from the fence so that there was a wide hole for Wilbur to walk through. Reconsider, reconsider, caught, cried the goose. Wilbur paid no attention. He stepped through the fence and into his yard. He walked to the trough and took a long drink of slops, sucking in the milk hungrily and chewing the popover. It was good to be home again. While Wilbur ate, Lurvy fetched a hammer and some eight-penny nails and nailed the board in place. Then he and Mr. Zuckerman leaned lazily on the fence, and Mr. Zuckerman scratched Wilbur's back with a stick. He's quite a pig, said Lurvy. Yes, he'll make a good pig, said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur heard the words of praise. He felt the warm milk inside his stomach. He felt the pleasant rubbing of the stick along his itchy back. He felt peaceful and happy and sleepy. This had been a tiring afternoon. It was still only about four o'clock, but Wilbur was ready for bed. I'm really too young to go out into the world alone, he thought as he lay down. I hope that you were listening in chapter three and that you've been thinking about why does Wilbur escape? And why does he return home? Now let's read chapter 4 and find out if we can find the answers to the rest of our questions. Chapter 4. Loneliness. The next day was rainy and dark. Rain fell on the roof of the barn and dripped steadily from the eaves. Rain fell in the barnyard and ran in crooked courses down into the lane where thistles and pigweed grew. Rain spattered against Mrs. Zuckerman's kitchen windows and came gushing out of the downspouts. Rain fell on the back of the sheep as they gazed in the meadow, grazed in the meadow. When the sheep tired of standing in the rain, they walked slowly up the lane and into the fold. Rain upset Wilbur's plans. Wilbur had planned to go out this day and dig a new hole in his yard. He had other plans too. His plans for the day went something like this. Breakfast at 6.30. Skim milk, crusts, middlings, bits of donuts, wheat cakes with drops of maple syrup sticking to them, potato skins, leftover custard pudding with raisins, and bits of shredded wheat. Breakfast would be finished at 7. From 7 to 8, Wilbur planned to have a talk with Templeton, the rat that lived under his trough. Talking with Templeton was not the most interesting occupation in the world, but it was better than nothing. From 8 to 9, Wilbur planned to take a nap outdoors in the sun. From 9 to 11, he planned to dig a hole or trench and possibly find something good to eat buried in the dirt. From 11 to 12, he planned to stand still and watch the flies on the boards, watch bees in the clover, and watch swallows in the air. 12 o'clock, lunchtime. Middlings, warm water, apple pairings, meat gravy, carrot scraplings, meat scraps, stale hominy, and the wrapper off a package of cheese. Lunch would be over at one. From one to two, Wilbur planned to sleep. From two to three, he planned to stretch, scratch itchy places by rubbing against the fence. 
From three to four, he planned to stand perfectly still and think of what it was like to be alive and to wait for Fern. At four would come supper. Skim milk, provender, leftover sandwich from Larry's lunchbox, prune skins, a morsel of this, a bit of that, fried potatoes, marmalade drippings, a little more of this, a little more of that, a piece of baked apple, a scrap of upside down cake. Wilbur had gone to sleep thinking about these plans. He woke at six and saw the rain, and it seemed as though he couldn't bear it. I get everything all beautifully planned out and it has to go in rain, he said. For a while, he stood gloomily indoors. Then he walked to the door and looked out. Drops of rain struck his face. His yard was cold and wet. His trough had an inch of rainwater in it. Templeton was nowhere to be seen. Are you out there, Templeton? called Wilbur. There was no answer. Suddenly, Wilbur felt lonely and friendless. One day, just like another, he groaned. I'm very young. I have no real friend here in the barn. It's going to rain all morning and all afternoon, and Fern won't come in such bad weather. Oh, honestly. And Wilbur was crying again for the second time in two days. At 6.30, Wilbur heard the begging of a pail. Lurvy was standing outside in the rain, stirring up breakfast. Come on, pig, said Lurvy. But Wilbur did not budge. Lurvy dumped his slops, scraped the pail, and walked away. He noticed that something was wrong with the pig. Wilbur didn't want food. He wanted love. He wanted a friend someone to play with him. Wilbur didn't want food. He wanted love. He wanted a friend, someone who would play with him. He mentioned this to the goose, who was sitting quietly in the corner of the sheepfold. Will you come over and play with me? He asked. Sorry, sorry, sorry said the goose. I'm sitting, sitting on my eggs. Eight of them. Got to keep them toasty, oasty, oasty warm. I have to stay right here. I'm no flibbery, flibbery, ibbery, gibbet. I do not play when there are eggs to hatch. I'm expecting goslings. Well, I didn't think you were expecting woodpeckers, said Wilbur bitterly. Wilbur next tried one of the lambs. Will you please play with me? he asked. Certainly not, said the lamb. In the first place, I cannot get into your pen, as I am not old enough to jump over the fence. In the second place, I am not interested in pigs. Pigs mean less than nothing to me. What did that lamb say? Pigs mean less than nothing to me? What do you mean, less than nothing, replied Wilbur. I don't think there is any such thing as less than nothing. Nothing is absolutely the limit of nothingness. It's the lowest you can go. It's the end of the line. How can something be less than nothing? If there were something that was less than nothing, then nothing would not be nothing. It would be something even though it's just a very little bit of something. But if nothing is nothing, then nothing is nothing. That is, that is less than nothing. Oh, be quiet, said the lamb. Go play by yourself. I don't play with pigs. Sadly, Wilbur lay down and listened to the rain. How did what the lamb said make Wilbur feel? Why did it make him feel that way? Soon he saw the rat climbing down the slanting board that he used as a stairway. Will you play with me, Templeton? asked Wilbur. Play, said Templeton, twirling his whisper whiskers. Play? I hardly know the meaning of the word. Well, 
said Wilbur. It means to have fun, to frolic, to run and skip and make merry. I never do any of those things if I can avoid them, replied the rat sourly. I prefer to spend my time eating, gnawing, spying, and hiding. I'm a glutton, but not a merry-making glutton. Right now, I'm on my way to your trough to eat your breakfast, since you haven't got enough sense to eat it yourself. And Templeton the rat crept stealthily along the wall and disappeared into a private tunnel that he had dug between the door and the trough in Wilbur's yard. Templeton was a crafty rat, and he had things pretty much his own way. The tunnel was an example of his skill and cunning. The tunnel enabled him to get from the barn to his hiding place under the pig trough without coming out into the open. He had tunnels and runways all over Mr. Zuckerman's farm and could get from one place to another without being seen. Usually, he slept during the daytime and was abroad only after dark. Wilbur watched him disappear into his tunnel, and in a moment he saw the rat's sharp nose poke out from underneath the wooden trough. Cautiously, Templeton pulled himself up over the edge of the trough. This was almost more than Wilbur could stand. On this dreary rainy day to see his breakfast being eaten by somebody else? He knew Templeton was getting soaked out there in the pouring rain, but even that didn't comfort him. Friendless, dejected, and hungry, he threw himself down into the manure. <laughs> Late that afternoon, Lurvy went to Mr. Zuckerman. I think there's something wrong with that pig of yours. He hadn't touched his food. Give him two spoonfuls of sulfur and a little molasses, said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur couldn't believe what was happening to him when Lurvy caught him and forced the medicine down his throat. This was certainly the worst day of his life. He didn't know whether he could endure the awful loneliness any more. He's sobbing. He just wants a friend. Darkness settled over everything. Soon there were only shadows and the noises of the sheep chewing up their cuds, and occasionally the rattle of a cow chain up overhead. You can imagine Wilbur's surprise when out of the darkness came a small voice he had never heard before. It sounded rather thin, but pleasant. Do you want a friend, Wilbur? It said. I'll be a friend to you. I've watched you all day, and I like you. But I can't see you, said Wilbur, jumping to his feet. Where are you? And who are you? I'm right up here, said the voice. Go to sleep. You'll see me in the morning. I hope you enjoyed chapter three and four of the book Charlotte's Web. And I hope that you'll come back for video number three to hear chapter five. I also hope that you'll think about these questions. What does Wilbur want more than anything? What does Wilbur feel when the sheep tells him he is less than nothing? And have you ever accidentally or on purpose made someone feel that way? So come back for video number three where we'll read chapter five of Charlotte's Web.